Hello everybody, we thank you so much for your interest in following us on the Summer Bible channel. We appreciate your likes, we appreciate your comments, and if this is your first time to watch us, please do not forget to subscribe in order to receive notification when a new video is released. Friends, this topic of this uh, Sabbath school is about death in a sinful world. This is uh, lesson 2 from October 1st to 7, 2022. So, um, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this moment to study your word. Open your hearts to receive and understand it. Please help us to, un to understand and put into practice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us read the memory text, which is in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as though one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin, all people sins. So Christ was the divine agent through whom God brought the universe and the world into existence. But when God the Father conferred special honor on Christ and announced that they together would create this world, Lucifer was envious and jealous of Jesus Christ. Having been cast out of heaven, Satan decided to destroy the happiness of Adam and Eve on earth and thereby cause grief in heaven. He imagined that if he could in any way beguile them, Adam and Eve, to disobedience, God will make some provision whereby they might be pardoned and he then himself and the fallen angels would be in far away to share with them of God's mercy. So friends, this week we will reflect on the fall of Adam and Eve and how sin and death took over our world and how God planted a seed of hope for humanity even from Eden. So let us see the number one um, topic, statements in tension statement attention so let us see um, what the bible says uh, in uh, genesis chapter 2 verses 16 to 17 in this text we see the reality of free will in the perfection of eden that is uh, why god uh, needed to warn adam and eve if uh, they could freely choose. So God wanted really Adam and Eve uh, before sin to choose whether they, they, they follow his instruction or they are following uh, certain instruction. So sometimes after the warning from God, Satan assumed the form of serpent and inter entered in Eden. Eve, Eve beheld the serpent joyfully eating the forbidden fruit Without dying, he himself had eaten and the forbidden fruits. So, and nothing happened to the serpent. That's why also uh, Eve took the fruit and ate it. From the perspective of human logic, the argument of a serpent sounded much more convincing than he did the word of God. First of all, there was no evidence in natural world so far the, of the existence of sin and death. Second, the serpent was actually eating the forbidden fruits and enjoying it very much. So why should Eve restrain herself from doing the same? So God's command seemed to be too restrictive and senseless to Eve. Unfortunately, in deciding between the two conflict statements, Eve ignored the three basic principles. First principle, human reason is not always the safest way to evacuate spiritual matters. Second, the word of God can appear to be illogical and senseless to us, but it is always right to trust worthy, and there are things that are not evil or wrong in themselves, but God has chosen them and the test of obedience. So let us see the lesson two of Monday, deceived by the serpent. How? God, how Adam and Eve were deceived by the servant. We see it in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 and 7. So in that chapter, 
Uh, the Genesis chapter 3 is one of the clearest examples of psychology of temptation. God had warned Adam and Eve that if they ate the forbidden fruit, they would certainly die, assuming that the form of Satan. So Satan used several rhetoric strategies to mislead Eve into sin. So first he generalized God's specific prohibition. So he asked her, has God really said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Eve can't argue that the prohibition was in regard only to that specific tree. For if they were ever eat from it or touch it, they would die. So Satan contradicted God's statement. He asserted categorically, you certainly will not die. So it was a matter of having confidence in God or having confidence in Satan. And finally, Satan accused God of deliberately suppressing essential knowledge from her and her husband. So the deceiver argued, for God know that one on the day you eat from it, so the forbidden fruit, your eyes will be opened and you become like God, knowing good and evil. So the curiosity of Eve led her into the enchanted ground of Satan. There, there she, fought, she was really forced to decide either to remain faithful to God's restraining command or to embrace Satan's seductive allurement. Doubting God's word, she used, to, she used her own senses, the empirical method, that of personal observation, to decide between the two conflict statements. So you can see some people argue that all forms of knowledge are valid as long as we retain that which is good. But the tragic experience of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden demonstrates that knowledge in and it for if, if itself can be very detriment, detrimental. There are some things that indeed we are better of not knowing something that really belongs to God. So why as a human should they go far and they try to understand the brain of God? That is really was the issue. The God said you should not eat, but questioning why we should not eat, that was really a big issue that caused Adam and Eve to fall. So let us see uh, the Tuesday lesson, which you will not die. The topic is you will not die. One powerful manifestation of this lie is seen in the common belief in the immortality of the soul. The notion was the basis of many ancient religion of philosophies in ancient Egypt. It motivated the mummification practices and the funerary architecture such as the scene, uh, such what you see in the pyramids. So this theory, this, th this theory also become one of the main pillars of Greek philosophy. For example, in the Republic of Plato, Socrates asked Glaucon, are you not aware that our soul is immortal and never perishes? In Plato's Phaedo, Socrates argued in a similar tone, saying that the soul is immortal and imperishable, and our souls really will exist in height. This philosophical concept would shape much of the Western culture, and even post-apostolic Christianity, but they originated much earlier in the Garden of Eden, with Satan himself saying, you will not die. So, Dying is something that we know that if we sin, we will die. But Satan is saying, no, you will never die. So the satanic theory of natural immortality of the soul has persisted. Even in our modern world, books, movies, and TV programs have all continued to promote the idea that we die. We simply pass into another Conscious state how unfortunate it is that error is proclaimed in many Christian pulpits as well. Even science has gotten involved. There is a foundation in the United States trying to create technology that it claims will enable us to, contract, to contact the dead 
whom they believe are still alive but exist. So we should be really, really be careful of that theory. So what was the consequences of sin? In Genesis chapter 3, verse 7 to 19, and Romans chapter 5 to 12, uh, verse 12, uh, we see uh, the many consequences of sin. Captivated by the persuasive speech of the serpent, Eve did not anticipate the far-reaching consequence of the road of the that was following. In itself, the act of eating from the forbidden fruit was not as significant as what it actually represented. By such of an act of disobedience, Eve broke her loyalty to God and assumed a new allegiance to Satan. Genesis chapter 3 described that the fall for Adam and Eve the sum of its most tragic consequence. So what happened? What happened? The Garden Eden was no longer the beautiful of present place it used to be. So they witnessed in dropping flower, falling leaf, the first sign of decay. Adam and his companion mourned more deeply. The new men now mourn over the dead. The death of the flare, delicate flowers were indeed a cause of sorrow. But when the good trees cast off their lives, the sin brought vividly to mind the stern fact that death is a portion of every living thing. Adam and Eve did not die immediately in the sense of, se of ceasing to live. But on the very same day they received the death sentence, the Lord told Adam, In the sweet of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you shall return. We see it in Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. The sad and the painful act is, just, is that just as humanity has experienced it through all ages, we today suffer the consequences of what happened in the Eden. How thankful can we be, though, that because of Jesus of the cross have, we have the hope of eternal life in a world where sin we never rise again. That is really a good hope. That, that in this life, the, the life that we're going to get is eternal life and no sin, no sin will rise again. So the last, the last, the last uh, uh, topic is the first gospel promise. The first gospel, the promise of first gospel. So we see it in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 to 21. See, now we see a hope. A hope. Genesis 3 described the dreadful tragedy that took over the world after the fall. Everything changed, and Adam and Eve could see the contrast between what this world used to be and what it had become. But in the midst of the frustration and despair, God gave them assurance for the present and the hope for the future. Hallelujah. First, he cursed the serpent with a word of messianic hope. He declared, And I will put in empty between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his hair. The word enmity implies not only a long lasting customary controversy between good and evil, but also a personal repulsion to sin, which has been implanted by God's grace in the human mind. By nature, we are completely fallen and slaves of sin. However, the grace that Christ implants, implants in every human life creates in us enmity against Satan. And it is this enmity are uh, a divine gift from Eden that allows us to accept his saving grace. Without this converting grace and the renewing power, humanity will continue to be the captive of Satan. I am going to repeat this one. This is very important. Without this converting grace and renewing power, humanity will not continue to be the captive of Satan. 
a servant ever ready to do his bidding. The Lord next used an animal sacrifice to illustrate the messianic promise. When Adam, according to God's special directions, made an offering for sin, it was to him a most painful ceremony. His hand must be raised to take life, which God alone could give, and make an offering for sin. It was the first time he had witnessed death. As he looked upon the bleeding victim, reefing in the agonies of death, he was to look forward by faith to the Son of God, whom the victim prefigured, who was to die man sacrifice, who was Jesus Christ. So this really is very important to understand that sacrifice that was made by Adam and Eve was symbolizing the sacrifice that's going to be made later by Jesus to save us. So, friends, thank you very much for um, having followed us and thank you for listening to us. And I invite you to follow us and uh, for the next, next lesson that's going to happen next Friday. God bless you. God keep you. Have a wonderful day.